Hello and welcome to another Century 21 Tech Talk Briefing with me, Jeff Tracy. In this special briefing, I'll be providing details about the operation and technical specifications of the experimental machine known as Supercar, the incredible technological advances of the modern age which ultimately resulted in the development of international rescue craft can be traced back to Supercar's creation in the mid-20th century. The craft was affectionately known as the marvel of the age. And thanks to Brain's research, we even have some black and white footage of the vehicle in action. The design and construction of Supercar was the result of five years work and a collaborative effort between one Professor Rudolf Popkis, an Austro-Hungarian, and Dr. Horatio Beaker, an Englishman. They built their own facility, the Black Rock Laboratory in the Nevada desert, to house many of their specialist projects, with living accommodations at the lab situated adjacent to the main control room, the supercar team were able to live and work together in comfort, while remaining on call 24 hours a day. From the main console, Professor Popkis maintained communications and monitored the operations of supercar from launching through to arrival at its destination. The console operator also had the capability to pilot supercar remotely, allowing the vehicle to be flown without a crew as required. This refinement of remote control technology at the time proved invaluable when criminals attempted to get their hands on supercar for themselves. Police records named two characters called Master Spy and Zarin, who repeatedly tried to steal the machine for their own nefarious purposes. Mike Mercury, now something of a legend in the aviation field, was the pilot of supercar. He was famous for his lightning reflexes and nerves of steel. On Supercar's first mission, Mercury rescued brothers Bill and Jimmy Gibson following a plane crash. Ten-year-old Jimmy was immediately drafted to join the Supercar team, but he brought with him an unusual companion, Mitch the Monkey. Yeah, that's right. Mitch was a chimpanzee who supposedly wreaked havoc and mischief wherever he went. The evidence, however, also suggests that he was a resourceful and unique asset to the supercar team. Currently on display as part of the Aviation Heritage Collection at Unity City, supercar measures 27 feet in length, 5.5 feet in height, and 11.5 feet in width. Supercar's rear-mounted wings could be extended to provide greater stability while in flight, increasing the wingspan to over 18 feet. Because of Supercar's compact size, it was limited to a maximum of five occupants, but made it relatively discreet and able to land in the tightest spots. Supercar was capable of speeds of up to 3,000 miles an hour in the air. For the safety of other vehicle users, its speed was originally limited to 150 miles an hour while traveling at low altitudes on roadways. Supercar was also one of the first craft developed that was capable of vertical takeoff and landing. Once the pilot had completed pre-flight checks, Supercar was launched vertically from inside the Black Rock Laboratory where it was housed. Once the port and starboard engines were charged and fired at 15,000 RPM, the lab's roof doors were opened. If the car was fully loaded with crew or cargo, Full boost on takeoff was necessary for it to ascend into the sky. At that point, the pilot would extend the wings and proceed at full speed to the desired destination. Supercar was fitted with a number of revolutionary features developed by Popkiss and Beaker. These made the craft the ideal machine for carrying out rescue missions, undercover operations, and exploring the globe. The team, of course, always endeavored to keep their operations top secret. Thanks to the careful maintenance of the Aviation Heritage Committee, many of Supercar's gadgets are still operational today. When visibility was severely limited, the pilot could engage the Clearview apparatus, which enabled perfect vision on the car's monitor through even the thickest of fog. 
The monitor could also display a video plan, which automatically plotted the best flight path for the pilot to take to the desired location. Supercar's versatility has remained almost unmatched in the past hundred years. It possessed the ability to travel in the air, under the water, into outer space, and even on land when required. The machine could travel to a depth of 400 feet underwater before succumbing to the pressure of the depths. It used to be called upon to rescue stranded submarines, explore lost civilizations, and to enter dangerous territories in complete secrecy. Supercar's plentiful oxygen supply enabled it to travel into space where it used to carry out operations the likes of which NASA and the world's military organizations simply could not achieve at the time. And although it was rarely required, the supercar was capable of traveling along the road like any other motor vehicle, at speeds which I guess must have dazzled the average 1960s police officer. Over the course of their many exploits, Beaker and Popkiss invented many other special devices for supercar, which we now take for granted. Electromagnets were fitted to the car, which were originally developed for military-grade transportation, but proved invaluable when a runaway train threatened the lives of the supercar team. Supercar was also fitted with a special cannon to safely bring down an Air Force balloon that was loaded with highly volatile fuel. Other modified features included an ejector seat, a drill, a device to electrically charge the hull in order to deter unwanted guests, and even a special pain formula which was able to turn the car invisible. Brains couldn't believe it when he heard about that one. Well, folks, we've reached the end of this series of briefings. It's been a great privilege to share these details with you, and I hope to have the opportunity to do so again very soon. So from me, and everybody here at International Rescue Headquarters, thank you for your attention. So long. Hello again, folks. Brains here. Welcome to another episode of Century 21 Tech Talk. In this briefing, we're going to be discussing the technical specifications of Fireball XL5. Fireball XL5 is an XL-class patrol ship used by the World Space Patrol. It is one of 30 identical XL craft in the WSP fleet. Each patrol ship is usually crewed by at least two trained astronauts, although specific assignments often require a a a additional personnel. One such person is Professor Matthew Maddock, chief engineer, navigator, s scientist, and a vital member of Fireball XL5's crew. Professor Maddock is a close friend of mine and has kindly offered to discuss the t technical details of Fireball XL5 for this briefing. And now, without further ado, I present Professor Matthew Maddock. <laughs> Thank you, Brains. It's real boss to be here. Howdy, folks. As Brains says, I'm Professor Matthew Maddock, and I guess I know just about everything there is to know about Fireball XL5. Commander Zero has given permission for me to share a few details about the craft with you. And I gather you have International Rescue's full security clearance too. Firstly, I have a small apology to make. It looks like some of the material in my presentation has been exposed to Vinta rays in my laboratory. And this has caused some of the footage to lose its color. Still can be helped. So let's get started. Well now, it might be best if I told you a little about the regular crew of XL5 before we discuss the craft. The primary crew comprises Commanding Officer Colonel Steve Zodiac, our expert in space medicine Dr. Venus, 
And finally, Robert, our co-pilot, and a robot of my own invention. Oh, and I mustn't forget Zuni, Venus's pet lazoon. He was here a moment ago. I wonder where he's disappeared to. I hope he doesn't cause any mischief for brains. Like the other XL class vessels, Fireball XL5 is based at Space City in the South Pacific. The craft is launched by a horizontal rail beside the control tower. Steve fires the main motors in the carrier sled, and XL5 is propelled along the launch rail. As the craft approaches the incline at the end of the rail, the secondary sled motors fire, closely followed by XL5's new Tomic hyperdrive, blasting fireball into the atmosphere at a terrific velocity. The launch sled is then recovered by an automated crane and returned to the launch rail. Returning to Space City is a much simpler process. XL5 is brought into a hover position above the landing apron and descends on its powerful landing thruster. Conditions on board Fireball are very comfortable, but then they gotta be. We can be on patrol duty for months at a time, and the ship is designed with this in mind. Some of the areas in which we spend our time include the relaxation lounge, the sleeping quarters, and, in my case, the navigation bay. The navigation bay is one of the most complex areas on the whole craft. It is equipped with an astroscope, spacemoscope, radar telescope, language decoders, and monitoring systems. Many of these sophisticated systems are linked to the main sensor dome, located above the navigation bay. From the main navigation console, I can plot a course to any sector of space required. I also use the equipment to scan unidentified objects and obtain information. One of the hazards of exploring uncharted regions of space is the chance of encountering bacteria and viruses that may have adverse effects on our crew. That's just one of the reasons that it's essential to have Dr. Venus with us on Fireball at all times. What she doesn't know about space medicine isn't worth knowing. Venus spends a lot of time in her laboratory near the sick bay and has been instrumental in saving us from one nasty thing or other on numerous occasions. Talking of nasty things, it's not just space viruses we have to worry about on patrol. There's also the danger of meeting some real unfriendly types, the kind of folks who would rather shoot first and ask questions later, if you know what I mean. Of course, that's something we're more than prepared for. XL5 is armed with a battery of powerful space interceptor missiles with a fantastic destructive capability. Anyone foolish enough to tangle with an XL cruiser is likely to regret it mighty fast. However, Leaving such unsavory things aside, one of the more pleasant duties of a fireball vessel is to investigate new planets. And boy, do we have the right tools for the job. Fireball XL5 is capable of landing on the surface of a planet just as it does at Space City. But more often than not, the main craft remains in planetary orbit and the landing is made by Fireball Junior. Fireball Junior is a small scout vessel consisting of the forward section of the main craft. It detaches from the main body of XL5 and makes its way to the surface of the planet, while the remaining crew pilot XL5 from the secondary control room in the Astrodome. Junior is equipped with its own landing system, incorporating retro rockets and landing struts. When the craft has landed, the crew can proceed with their investigation on foot. 
but will usually scout the area on their jet mobiles. Fireball Junior is also designed to function as a submersible, which has come in pretty useful from time to time. When it comes to extra-vehicular exploration in space, the crew make use of the ejector bay, thruster packs, and oxygen pills. A lot of people ask me how oxygen pills protect from the dangers of total vacuum, space radiation, and so forth. The answer's actually pretty simple. You see... What in tarnation? Welcome home! Oh, gee, I, 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 I'm sorry for interrupting, Professor Matic, but you see, Zuni here got hold of some OD-60 while playing in c c close proximity to some liquid alsterine. And, uh, well... Say no more, Brains. Come on, you tootie lazoon. Time to get you out of here before you cause any more trouble. It's been a real pleasure being here at International Rescue today, and I hope you all get a chance to come visit Space City very soon. So long for now. Hi, folks. W welcome back to Century 21 Tech Talk with me, Brains. In this briefing, we're going to be discussing the technical specifications of the World Aquanaut Security Patrol Vessel Stingray. As the flagship of the WASP fleet, Stingray is recognized around the world, and I am just one of its many admirers. However, there is someone else who is far better equipped to tell you more about this incredible c c craft. Former WASP member and aquanaut in charge of Thunderbird 4, Gordon Tracy. Gordon is currently visiting Marineville for an oceanographic conference and is joining us by Secure Satellite Linkup. Hi folks, Gordon Tracy speaking. I guess old brains wanted some time off. So he's asked me to give you a little presentation about Stingray. And what better place to host the briefing than Stingray's home base, Marineville. Stingray is the latest in a long line of impressive vessels used by the World Aquanaut Security Patrol. Before joining International Rescue, I served in their prestigious ranks and was assigned to active duty on Stingray under the command of its former captain, Bradley Holden, later to become Captain Gray of Spectrum. Since Holden's departure from the WASP, Stingray has been crewed by Captain Troy Tempest, a veteran of the old submarine service, and hydrophone operator Lieutenant George Lee Sheridan, better known to the personnel of Marineville as Phones. They are often accompanied on their missions by Marina, the beautiful daughter of Aphany, ruler of the undersea kingdom of Pacifica. Troy and Phones rescued Marina from the evil King Titan of Titanica, a foe who continues to plot against them to this day. Stingray is located in Pen 3 under Marineville's control tower and remains at permanent readiness so that it can be launched at a moment's notice. When action stations is sounded, the crew take up standby positions in the injector bay, poised for the action. If the launch station's alert sounds, the crew activate their injector tubes and are lured towards Pen 3, where Stingray awaits their arrival. The hatch opens by remote, and the injector tubes connect to the floor of the control cabin. The crew chairs are lowered into position and clamped in place. The injector tubes are then retracted and the main hatch sealed. The elevators holding Stingray's lift platform in position are released and the craft descends into the water. Rate 1 acceleration is applied. Stingray rises off its cradle and out through the doors of the pen into the launch tunnel. 
After a fast transit along the launch tunnel, the ocean door is lowered and Stingray bursts out into the ocean, ready to proceed with its latest mission. Stingray is 80 feet long and is the successor to the earlier Wasp vessels Thresher and Swordfish, both of which were built around the revolutionary Ratemaster propulsion system that began development in the late 2040s. It is this fantastic propulsion system that allows Stingray to travel at a maximum sustained speed of 600 knots, making it almost four times faster than Thunderbird 4. The craft is able to operate at depths that far surpass the operational limits of conventional submarines and has even survived a treacherous journey through a subterranean sea. Stingray's missions often bring the crew into contact with hostile undersea aliens intent on destroying the people of the land. Thankfully, the craft is armed with a full complement of powerful sting missiles which are able to penetrate the armor plating of most enemy vessels. These missiles can be adjusted to one of ten destructive force settings and contain sophisticated guidance systems, making them highly accurate. No patrol ship would be complete without a variety of auxiliary craft, and Stingray is no exception. The ship carries a pair of aqua sprites, two-person mini submersibles that are perfect for scouting small spaces and ferrying supplies between larger submersibles. When a quieter approach is required, the crew can use the single-person sea bugs, powered undersea maneuvering units capable of fantastic speed. If the crew need to go ashore in a hurry, they can ride one of three monocopters. These single-person hovering transports work on the same principle as our international rescue hover bikes. Another vital component of Stingray's equipment is the hydrophone system, a vast improvement on the old style sonar. The hydrophone is a much more sophisticated and sensitive instrument. It can detect the smallest movement in the undersea environment and provide crucial early warning of potential threats in the area. If Stingray is damaged and taking on water, the emergency pumps will automatically start pumping the water out again. If the main power system fails, there is also a manual pump system that can be used, although this is much slower than the automated system. Gee! Attention, this is Marineville Control. All personnel stand by for battle stations. That's a sound I haven't heard in quite a while. I'd better report to the control tower now, folks. The Stingray crew may need some assistance with this one. See you soon, and PWOR! Data Bank, commence recording. This is General Ed Straker of the World Security Service. In this briefing, I'll be discussing the technical specifications of the McLean 1 jet air car. The McLean 1 is a unique vehicle designed for travel by land, sea, and air. It was created by renowned scientist Professor Ian McLean. Professor McLean, known for his notable work in the field of advanced electronics, is a former advisor to the now defunct World Intelligence Network. McLean and his young son, Joe, were recruited by the then director of WIN, Shane Weston, to spearhead Project 90, an effective, yet morally questionable, counterintelligence initiative. After WIN was amalgamated with the World Security Service, Professor McLean transferred to our Research and Development Division. 
Given our shared interest in electronics, Professor McLean and I often discuss potential applications for the research in which he is engaged. The McLean 1 jet air car was constructed in 2010. It is 32 feet in length, making it larger than the majority of other private vehicles on the road today. The car is powered by a pair of aero turbine engines and can achieve speeds of 200 miles per hour on land. 300 miles per hour in the air, and 70 knots on water. Professor McLean designed the car for performance rather than for speed, hence its rather unusual appearance. Entry to the car is by one of the hatches on either side of the driver's cabin. Steering and throttle operation are usually set on manual, but can be switched to computer-assisted control when traveling at high speed or in poor visibility. To transition the vehicle into flight mode, Professor McLean pulls the conversion lever in the central console. The twin rear stabilizing fins extend on hydraulic rams. The four vertical thrust jets under the car are engaged and the vehicle rises off the road. When the vehicle is clear of the road, the rear wheels fold up and the front wheels retract under the nose of the car. The main wings fold out to complete the flight mode and the vehicle takes to the sky. The car's hover jets may be used for short bursts of aerial activity, such as navigating a hazard in the road ahead without converting to full flight mode. While in flight mode, the McLean 1 is incredibly versatile, excelling in high-speed maneuvers and low-speed precision flying. The craft can adopt a stationary hover position, providing a stable aerial platform. From this position, retrieval of personnel at ground level is straightforward, especially in situations where a larger helijet may prove impractical. The ventral storage compartments contain a variety of useful equipment. A set of electromagnetic grabs are located in the cargo hull. Grabs can lift objects weighing up to two tons. Oversized payloads are carried outside the car, but some smaller payloads can be brought inside the vehicle when the grabs are retracted. The ventral section of the car is also equipped with a small folding receiver dish, able to pick up signals and impulses on coded frequencies. I won't go into the specifics of the receiver's operation in this briefing, although I can confirm it was a key piece of equipment during Project 90. In addition to the great potential of its land and air operation, the McLean 1 works equally effectively on the sea. The craft can be transitioned into sea mode directly from the flight mode. The pilot guides the craft towards the water using the vertical thrust jets and gently touches down on the surface. The central and outer buoyancy tanks are trimmed according to the vehicle's payload and the propulsion system is engaged. While in aqua mode, the McLean 1 is propelled using a variant of the thrust jet principle, though it also has a pair of standard propellers that can be deployed for travel at low speed. The McLean 1's ability to overcome obstacles and operate in various conditions makes it an incredibly useful piece of technology. Although it was developed for civilian use, Professor McLean has helped incorporate some of its incredible versatility into the World Security Services fleet. Examples of his tireless work are evident in the multi-role Storm Trident and Star Striker World Security craft. This concludes the briefing if you'd like to learn more about the McLean 1, please speak with Professor McLean. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to discuss the finer points of its construction and perhaps give you a demonstration of its features. But a word of advice, you might have some trouble getting him to stop talking about it. Data Banks, he's recording.